So I'd like to thank Sriram for inviting me to give this summary of the meeting. And I would like to thank all the students for attending. So now in this summary, I'm not going to go through the individual talks and try to summarize each talk. Instead, what I will try to do is to give an overview of the field of early universe cosmology, where we stand. And now in terms of giving an overview, I'm obviously going to be very subjective and also a little bit controversial. So let me start with the goals of early universe cosmology, because I think it's important to keep this in mind. So we want to understand the origin and early evolution of the universe. So that's been a goal for a long time. Now we have lots of data and we would also like to explain the origin of the structure that we see in the universe. We would like to explain all of the data that we have. But as physicists, we would also like to make predictions for upcoming and future observations, predictions with which our models can be falsified. So I think it's always good to keep these goals in mind. Now, a major tool that we use in early universe cosmology in order to connect the early universe to observations is the theory of cosmological perturbations. And the first lecture, the lecture by David Wallace, was a very nice review of this subject. So here I show a space-time sketch. So the vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is space. And this space diagram, space-time diagram, illustrates what happens in inflation. There's an early universe phase, and in this early universe phase, uh, the universe is expanding exponentially. So the idea is that we compute perturbations in this early universe phase, and then we use the theory of cosmological perturbations to propagate what we've computed all the way to the present time. So I can't emphasize more the importance of this subject theory of cosmological perturbations. So this is the main workhorse in terms of uh, th doing theoretical calculations. So now data, we have the microwave background, which is to very good accuracy isotropic. And then if you look deeper, then we, we start to see the anisotropies and we can quantify the anisotropies in a way that you've seen in many talks. So uh, angular scale, amplitude of the anisotropies. So what I want to emphasize here is the fact that this red curve, the origin of this red curve was actually understood 10 years before inflation. It was understood uh, in pioneering papers by Zeldovich and Zuniaev and by Peebles and you. So it is false to claim that this red curve was first predicted by inflation. So I want to try to play devil's advocate here. So this is a graph from the Zeldovich Sunyayev paper of 1969-1970. The vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is space, and uh, the diagonal line is the standard big bang horizon, or more precisely, it is the Hubble radius, at least until recombination. So now what Zeldovich and Zunyayev assumed is that some mechanism produces fluctuations, which from the point of view of standard Big Bang cosmology look like they are super horizon. So these fluctuations, as you learned in David Wan's talk, are standing waves, which don't oscillate until the scale enters the Hubble radius. So from this picture, you see that different wavelengths perform different numbers of oscillations between when they start to oscillate and the time when the microwave background is released. And this is the physics which explains the origin of the acoustic oscillations in the angular power spectrum of the microwave background. And it is the same physics which leaves you imprints in the matter power spectrum. So again, I summarize this here, the historical digression. Given a roughly scaling band power spectrum of fluctuations on what appears to be super horizon from the point of view of standard Big Bang cosmology, uh, 
And this spectrum was known already in 1970 to be a good description of uh, the galaxy distribution. Then the predictions of 1970 is acoustic oscillations in the CMB eigen power spectrum and baryon acoustic oscillations. Okay, so where does that leave inflation? Well, the question that was not addressed back in 1970 is how does one obtain such a spectrum? In fact, there is no explanation for the origin of such a spectrum in the context of standard Big Bang cosmology. And we need to modify the theory of the variable universe if we want to have a chance to explain the data. And inflationary cosmology is indeed the first scenario based on causal physics which yields such a spectrum, but it is not the only one. So I remind the students of the difference between Hubble radius and horizon. So the horizon is a forward light cone of a point on the initial Cauchy surface, and it carries causal contact information. The Hubble radius is a local concept. It is simply the inverse expansion rate, and it is important for the propagation of fluctuations. So in standard Big Bang cosmology, the two are the same, and therefore we have a horizon problem. So in any successful early universe cosmology, the horizon has to be much, much larger than the Hubble radius today. If we want to explain the origin of structure, then scales that we observe today have to originate inside the Hubble radius at early times. And then if you want to start fluctuations as quantum vacuum perturbations, then we need a squeezing mechanism in order to allow the classicalization that we heard about in several talks. And finally, you need to have scale balance. Okay, and inflation is indeed one scenario which satisfies all these four criteria. And this is something which uh, Professor Bartolo explained. So again, we have an early phase of exponential expansion. Scales that we observe today start out inside the Hubble radius. The horizon becomes exponentially larger than the Hubble radius because the Hubble radius is constant during inflation. And the fact that you have constant energy density during inflation that is the physics that guarantees that you get a scaling band spectrum. But these four criteria are also satisfied in a bouncing cosmology. We heard about bouncing cosmologies from Patrick Peter's lecture. So in a bouncing cosmology, the scale factor as a function of time has, uh, starts in a contracting phase and then you have some uh, new physics which gives a transition to expansion. And this is a corresponding space-time sketch, time, space, Hubble radius contracting in the contracting phase, expanding in the expanding phase. Here I draw co-moving coordinates. In co-moving coordinates, perturbations have constant wavelength. And you see, first of all, the horizon is infinite. So horizon much larger than Hubble radius. Scales that we observe today start out sub-Hubble. Therefore, we have a chance of causally explaining them. Now, a scenario which was not addressed so far in this school slash workshop is the emergent scenario where you assume that there is an early phase where the universe is static, or maybe it's an early phase where, where you don't even have space time. And then you have a phase transition to the usual standard Big Bang cosmo uh, cosmological evolution. So now in this setup, the horizon is also infinite. The Hubble radius is therefore much smaller than the horizon. Uh, if this phase is indeed quasi-static, then fluctuations maintain constant wavelength, and so they start out sub-Hubble. So the bottom line is that there is more than one scenario um, of early universe cosmology which is consistent with the basic observations. In fact, Inflation, bouncing cosmologies, and emergent cosmologies all lead to the late time lambda CDM paradigm. So it is false to say that lambda CDM includes inflation. So now we heard about the status of the lambda CDM paradigm. And um, from the point of view of people like myself who do pencil and paper calculations only, not very accurate the status, the observational status of lambda CDM is great. However, we also heard that there are some small tensions that might become important, the h naught tension and the Sparsky I have nothing to say about that. 
Claro. So now I want to say some critical things about the scenario. Okay. So, so if I may just ask, there are some participants with their microphones unmuted and we're hearing some background noise. Um, so if you are Krishna, PB, Rika, or Suraj Jyoti Das, could you please mute your microphone? I don't seem to have the ability to do so without muting everybody. Shantras, Shantras, are you around? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Can you just mute everyone, please, other than the host, co host Yes, sir. I muted. There is but one we are still able to hear some. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, sure. let me continue. Please. I'll just continue speaking a little bit louder. So, in inflation, space time is described by the Anson Hilbert action. Matter is described by a slowly rolling scalar field. And you heard a lot about scalar fields throughout this um, school workshop. And you also heard that quantum vacuum perturbations are the source of perturbations. Okay, now let me turn a little bit to this scalar field. So here's a scalar field Lagrangian, and here's the equation for the energy density and for the pressure. In order to get exponential expansion, we need potential energy domination. And hence, we need the potential to be very flat Otherwise, you induce large kinetic energies. So you need slow roll condition one. You need this uh, slow roll condition to be maintained for a long time, and therefore you need the second slow roll condition. And as we heard from Katie's uh, lecture, if you want inflation to be uh, an attractor in initial condition space, then you should have large field inflation. Okay, good. So now in the context of inflation, you can do many studies. And we heard a lot about gravitational wave production, gauge field production, features in the potential that can be induced, primordial black holes and stochastic effects. And in principle, all of these uh, issues could be studied in alternatives to inflation. So this is a suggestion for student projects. But I want to turn to the question whether inflation can actually emerge from a ultraviolet complete theory. No doubt inflation is self-consistent as an effective field theory. And there have been a set of objections against inflation. One of them coming from string theory under the name of the swamp land conjectures, and the other more general coming from quantum gravity considerations, the transplant in censorship conjecture. So first of all, swamp land constraints. So there's a huge landscape of effective field theories. With effective field theories, you can do anything you want. Any space-time dimension goes, any number of scalar fields goes, any shape of the potential goes, any field range is okay. Superstring theory is very constraining. Fixed number of space-time dimensions, any scalar field has a geometrical interpretation, and therefore only a very small subset of effective field theories is actually consistent with ultraviolet physics. The rest line is swamp land. So if this is our ultraviolet uh, theory, then only a very small subset of possible effective field views are allowed. And what are the conditions for these consistent effective field theories? Well, the field range has to be small, the potential has to be steep, and if there's a local extreme amount of the potential, it has to be sufficiently tachyonic. And you see that these are exactly the opposite criteria than the criteria needed for slow roll inflation. So hence, slow roll inflation is in the swamp, false vacuum inflation is in the swamp, the cosmological constant as dark energy is in the swamp. However, there are some inflationary models that can escape from the swamp, for example, warm inflation. So now let me turn to the other set of objections, which is a generalization of Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture. And the starting point for this is a problem for cosmological fluctuations in inflation, which Jerome, Macht, and myself pointed out 20 years ago, which is the fact that if, if inflation lasts for a long time, then scales that we observe today start out in this transplantian region of ignorance. Now, when Waffa heard about this problem, he decided that this should be turned into a principle. So, the Transplantian cosmic censorship conjecture says that ultraviolet physics prohibits any cosmology in which Transplantian modes exit the Hubble horizon. 
Mathematic grid means that if you start at some initial time, t sub i, you take the Planck length, you evolve until a later time t sub r, you have to remain smaller than the uh, Hubble radius. So, okay, now uh, I'll briefly skim over the justification. Um, one justification is analogous to uh, what prohibits supercharged black holes. So general relativity as an effective field theory allows for black hole solutions with charge greater than the mass. These have naked singularities and uh, the Cauchy problem cannot be set up and they are non-unitality problems. So Penrose conjecture that even though the effect of field theory emits these pathological solutions, the, even, though if, yeah, even though the effect of field theory admits pathological solutions, the ultraviolet physics will disallow them. So now we say the singularity is analogous to trans planckian modes, the black hole horizon becomes the Hubble horizon, and therefore we should um, prohibit observers outside the Hubble horizon from ever being able to see trans planckian modes. There's also a unitarity problem for that, and I'll skip over that because I'm looking at the time. Okay, so now if you apply this to inflation, so this is my space-time diagram of inflation, the third time you've seen it, the inflationary phase, post-inflation. We don't want inflation to last longer than I drew. We don't want the Planck scale at the beginning of inflation to become larger than the Hubble horizon. However, if inflation is to be successful, then the present Hubble horizon has to start out sub-Hubble at the beginning of inflation, otherwise there's no successful structure formation scenario. And you see, this gives you an upper bound on the duration of inflation, this gives you a lower bound. And these two bounds can only be consistent if the Hubble expansion rate during inflation is sufficiently small, meaning this line is sufficiently to the right. You go through the mathematics, and you find that the energy scale of inflation has to be less than three times 10 to the nine GV, which means that the tensor to scalar ratio, primordial tensor to scalar ratio is less than 10 to the minus 30. Okay, so what about alternatives to inflation? Balancing cosmologies are completely consistent with the TCC because fluctuations never approach the Planck length, emergent cosmologies as well. So from the point of view of TCC, Alternatives to inflation are on a more solid footing. So, okay, so these are my conclusions concerning inflation. What about alternatives to inflation? So we heard about the ekpyrotic scenario, which among bouncing cosmologies is the most promising one because we have a stable contracting phase. So we heard about uh, Bouncing cosmologists in the lectures by Patrick Peter, by Ifu Tsai, by uh, Yamaguchi san, and by Jerome. So, uh, good. So I can skip over this slide. The only thing that I want to say is that negative exponential potentials, which yield vectorotic contraction, are ubiquitous in string theory. So you take such an exponential potential, negative exponential potential, which gives you slow contraction. That means P has to be small, which means that the potential has to be steep. You solve the equation of motion for the scalar field. It's only logarithmic time dependence. And hence the scalar field in one Hubble expansion time evolves only a short distance. The potential is steep. The second derivative is large. So it's completely consistent with the swamp line criterion. So, safe egg process. Now, the problem for bouncing cosmologists has always been to obtain a non-singular bounce, a safe bounce. And we would actually like to also obtain a large amplitude of gravitational waves, since inflation does not produce a large amplitude of gravitational waves, if you accept the arguments I gave you before. And so now recently we realized that we, if we add one more small ingredient to the ekpyrotic scenario, namely an S brain, that then we immediately get a non-singular bounce. We get a scaling variance spectrum of cosmological fluctuations with no red tilt, 
and we get a scaling around spectrum of gravitational waves with a slight blue tilt. And we get consistency relations for cosmological observations. We get automatically reheating after epirosis. And the whole thing is obtained by introducing this small ingredient into the usual effect of action. And this small ingredient here is an object, a relativistic object, which lives at a fixed point in time. And if, so this is the S brain, it has a tension. And if you look at the energy density and the pressure of the S brain, you immediately see that this can, this violates the null energy condition and therefore it can mediate a transition between contraction and expansion. And Subod will recognize this very well because we already worked with that a number of years ago. Okay, now I still have five minutes, Subod, is that right? Yes, you do. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, good. So we have not heard much about the emergent cosmology. And I'll give you one example of emergent cosmology, which is my favorite model, which is string gas cosmology. So instead of assuming that space-time is filled with point particles, we assume that space-time is filled with fundamental strings. Fundamental strings have features which point particles don't have. They can wind space. And they also have stringy excitations. And if we imagine that space is a torus of radius r, then we can look at the energies of the momentum modes, which point particles have, of the winding modes, which point particles do not have, and of the oscillatory modes. And we see that there's a new symmetry. If you take r to one over r, and you exchange the momentum and the winding modes, then you have a symmetry of the mass states. So it's, if string theory is a correct ultraviolet theory of nature, then we have new degrees of freedom and new symmetries. And if you look at a box of strings and you let the radius of that box decrease, then you find that the temperature never exceeds a limited temperature. So no temperature singularity. So if you look at the usual position operator, it is, do, it is the Fourier transform of the momentum modes. In string theory, there's a corresponding winding mode and there's a dual position operator. And if you go to, to the early universe where position, where momenta and windings are comparable, you find that you have two sets of position operators for each topological dimension of space. And then you find that you get the conclusion that if you go back to the early universe, there is no chance that effective supergravity will give you a good description of the evolution of the universe. You need at least twice the number of spatial dimensions. Okay, so now if you assume that you have this emergent phase, and if you assume that you have thermal fluctuations of strings in this early universe, then you find a scale invariant spectrum of cosmological perturbations. So, good. good. So, unfortunately, I don't have time to, to give you the calculations. I'll just uh, jump to the main conclusion is that you get a scale invariant spectrum of density perturbations like for inflation with a slight red tilt like for inflation. You can compute the perturbations of uh, gravitational waves. You get scale invariant spectrum like for inflation, but you get a blue tilt. Okay, so the challenge is to derive a consistent dynamical description of the early phase. And this is a challenge for the students and for some initial ideas I refer to these papers. So now I'll come to the conclusions. So first of all, provocative conclusions. This is not yet provocative. So I've shown you that string gas cosmology is consistent with the TCC and it's consistent with the swamp line criteria because it comes from string theory. So my provocative conclusion is that based on fundamental physics, it looks like alternatives to inflation are more promising than inflation for the reasons that I illustrated up here. Okay, so now I want to end with less provocative conclusions, general conclusions. So I think that the future is bright for early universe cosmology 
for two reasons. We have key theoretical challenges. We still do not have a very good theoretical understanding of the very old universe. We have toy models, but no robust theoretical embedding of the toy models. Another major mystery is dark energy. We've heard a little bit about that today, but I think there might be a very close connection between the dark energy cosmological constant mystery and the mystery of the early universe. We also still don't know what the dark matter is. We know that there is dark matter. So there are theoretical challenges which are unsolved, which are very important and which makes the field bright. We also have new and improved observation windows. We have a new generation of microwave background experiments, new large scale structure surveys, and new observation windows such as 21 centimeter cosmology. And here in terms of the CMB, I want to mention CMB spectral distortions. So this, the fact that we have the observation advances and major theoretical challenges, I think that implies that the future is bright. And let me end with a politically correct slide. I think that early universe cosmology is an extremely inclusive field. In order to tackle the mysteries of early and late time cosmology, we need help from all fields of physics. We need general relativity to describe space time. We need quantum field theory to describe matter. If we want to unify matter and space time, we need super string theory. Then ideas from condensed matter physics have played crucial roles in cosmology and they will continue to play a crucial role. We have phase transitions and defects, which Figueroa spoke about. And then we have possible uh, dark matter models based on condensed matter physics ideas. And you can read about that in an excellent review article by Elisa Ferreira. Obviously we have difficult equations to solve. We need progress in mathematics. We need progress in numerics and uh, Katie's lecture has given some uh, sig signals of that. And we are also forced to rethink some basic aspects of quantum mechanics and I'm sure I left out many things, but I will turn to this slide and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Robert, for, for your summary. Um, since, of course, we started this session uh, five minutes late and I plan on uh, having some fairly brief uh, concluding uh, remarks, I would say that maybe we have time for a few uh, comments or questions from the audience about your summary. Um, if that's okay with you, Robert? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we'll just take them in, in the order that they came and then obviously there'll be a time cut off, so we'll try and get to as many as we can. So the first question I believe comes from uh, Swagat Mishra. Swagat, if you'd like to please just unmute and ask Robert your question. Hi, uh, hi Robert. Hi. So my question is how general are these uh, uh, swampland criteria? Okay, the swampland criteria First of all, they are not theorems. They are based on assuming that superstring theory is correct. So now if we, if we do calculations that are well controlled, we can't do many calculations which are well controlled, starting from superstring theory. We find agreement with these conjectures. And, and uh, second thing, since, since we have a, a future digital-like uh, expansion in our universe in dark energy, uh, if this lasts for long enough, eventually it, it will lead to a transplantian problem, right? Well, you see, the conclusions that I would draw from both the swampland and from the TCC is that dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. We cannot have that. I see. The universe will not be accelerating forever. Okay. I see. We need, therefore, we need a really new understanding of dark energy. It is not a cosmological constant. All right, all right. Okay. This is supposed to be a provocative remark. So, then the, the next question, I believe, is uh, from Suratna. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, my question is that TCC not only brings R to a very small value because epsilon has to be very small. 
Now, if epsilon is very small, ns has to only depend on eta. So if uh, we also have uh, the decider con conjecture, then eta has to be greater than one. Then yes. either, so then the ns is in contradiction with uh, the observations in that way. So, so once you I have- didn't mention, I didn't mention another conclusion that I would draw from um, the TCC. And this is that simply inflation is extremely fine tuned, even if you try to make it at low energy scale. Okay. And it is this fine tuning problems which you are alluding to. So you need some very special initial conditions, extremely unlikely uh, potentials. Yeah, that's that what my point was. Yes. Okay, okay so provocative comment. You, if, you, if the TCC is correct, then I think uh, you should uh, abandon inflation. Uh, yeah. Warm inflation is better than still cold inflation, but okay. <laughs> but R would be very small. Right. That's true. Okay, and then maybe we have time for one last uh, one last uh, question. Um, um, let's see, Rajiv, you've, you've you've asked quite a few questions uh, this this uh, afternoon morning. So, um, if it's okay with you, I'll I'll skip to uh, Arsalan Adil. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, please unmute yourself. Uh, thanks. I I don't want to overstep anything. So, uh, I uh, so I was just wondering. In the case of the string a gas cosmology that you pointed out with the finite temperature with the increasing size, I'm wondering whether that helps alleviate um, any of these so-called cosmological measure problems. I don't know. Because the way that we describe the emergent cosmology right now is classically. So, so I will pass on, on this question. In general, I pass on measure on questions which involve the measure. Measures. See, I like statements like, is a particular classical solution an attractor in initial condition space or not? I think this is very well defined, but, but if you ask what about the measure problem, I just feel, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about, so I, I don't want to say anything. I see, I see, thanks. Okay, given the briefness of that, then Rajiv, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Please. Okay, sure. Thanks. Hi, Robert. Uh, I just want to know from you that if you, if even really believes that the TCC is correct, and as you mentioned that the, the quantum modes will remain quantum, then how can we possibly observe them uh, at all? Well, you will, the conclusion is that you will not observe modes that had a wavelength smaller, that ever had a wavelength smaller than a Planck length. Which means they will never ever exit the horizon and they will never be classical. That's right. Okay. In the cosmological context. In, okay. Okay. Like in standard Big Bang cosmology, mm -hmm. modes never exit the Hubble horizon. In a uh, emergent scenario, they, they do. But uh, sorry, uh, if the uh, energy scale in the emergent phase is smaller than the Planck energy scale, then the only modes that exit the Hubble horizon will be those which are super Planckian in wavelength. And the same statement is for bouncing cosmologies. I see. Okay, thanks. 